Hello Russian learners! This is the Arus Pro channel. I'm Anastasia and in this video I am going to tell you about the accusative case in Russian. You are going to learn about four main meanings of the accusative case. I am also going to give you a lot of examples and explain each meaning in detail. And at the end I'm also going to tell you about a very useful construction using the accusative case that you can use and make your Russian more natural. So be sure to watch till the end to learn about this very important construction. So let's achieve it! The first meaning is direct object. The accusative case is also often called the objective case. But before I explain what a direct object means, please compare these six situations. Книга лежит на комоде. Я читаю книгу. У меня есть конфета. Я ем конфету. Мне нравится картина. Я люблю картину. So, in the very first sentence in each pair, the nouns book, candy, picture were subjects of the verb. You remember from my previous lesson on the nominative case that the subject of the sentence is the noun or pronoun that controls the verb. So, in the second sentence, in each pair, our nouns don't control the verb. They are affected by the verb's action. If I'm reading the book, I do something with the book. So, the action of the verb is directed at the book. So, the book becomes the object of the action, the object of the verb. We call it a direct object because our action is directly pointed at this, um, this object, this noun. What else uh, tells us it's a direct object? We don't have any preposition between the verb and the book. If I'm saying, for example, I'm sitting um, on the balcony with the book. So, with the book will not be a direct object because it has a preposition with. But I'm reading a book. Can you feel it? My action is directed at the book. So, the book is directly affected by my action, by my reading. Same thing with eating a candy. So, I eat a candy. That's, um, that means I'm doing something with it directly. In the third pair of sentences, you might say that uh, there is no difference because both sentences mean I like the picture. But it's a different phrasing. Мне нравится картина. Remember, this construction literally means the picture is pleasing to me. So, the picture is the subject of the verb. But я люблю картину or я люблю эту картину. We might add эту, this picture. So, I like or love this picture. Now, I am the subject. So, the pronoun I, я, controls the verb люблю and the picture becomes the object. You might say, why do we need two verbs, two different phrasings for one and the same thing? If both verbs mean like or to be pleasing, 
Why do we need two ways of phrasing it? If you are asking yourself this question, I'm going to tell you that there are no absolute synonyms in a language. So the verbs любить and нравиться have different degrees of liking. It is especially noticeable when we talk about people. Он мне нравится. Well, I might uh, go on a date with him sometime. But я люблю его. That's already something serious. Now, you noticed that in the second sentence in each pair we have a change of the ending on our nouns. Книга becomes книгу. Конфета becomes конфету. Картина becomes картину. So, this changing of the ending is the actual representation of the accusative case in the word form. You remember from our first lesson that a case is just a situation, a real-life situation that is reflected in the language, in the words ending. So, here we change our endings from a to u. And we do it because our nouns are feminine. Now, what happens to masculine nouns, neutral nouns, and plural nouns? Let's see. Это ручка, а это карандаш. Я держу ручку, я держу карандаш. Это конфета, а это яблоко. Я ем конфету, я ем яблоко. Это конфета, а это конфеты. Я ем конфету, я ем конфеты. So no change for neutral, masculine and plural inanimate. What about animate nouns? Compare. Я люблю эту картину. Я люблю Наташу. Я люблю сестру. Я люблю маму. Я люблю бабушку. So nouns that denote female persons change in accusative just like other nouns of the feminine gender. And I'm sure you also keep in mind the nouns папа, дедушка, дядя that are masculine, but due to their ending, а and я, they behave just like feminine nouns, but they are masculine, remember? So these nouns will change in accusative just like feminine nouns. Я люблю папу, я вижу дедушку, я встречаю дядю. Pay attention to the ending of the word дядя. So nouns ending in я change their ending to you in accusative. It's the soft variant of this ending. А is the hard variant, it changes to у, and я is the soft variant. It changes to you. What if you want to say I love John or I love my friends? So what if you want to use an animate masculine noun or an animate plural noun in accusative? This is a tricky point here because the endings will be different for them, for animate nouns in particular. And I will go over them in detail in a separate video when we are going to talk about the genitive case because those endings are the same as the genitive endings. I already talked about it a little bit in my other video. I will leave the link to this video in the description and you can get uh, the initial idea of how to use animate, masculine and plural nouns in accusative. And I repeat, 
it will be discussed in a separate video a little bit later. The second meaning of the accusative case, a very important one, is the meaning of direction. When we use the Russian equivalents of the verb to go, so-called verbs of motion, we use them with the accusative case when saying I'm going somewhere. Well, actually in Russian, literally we are saying I'm going to somewhere, I'm going to a place. And this to idea, where to, is different from the idea where at, when we are saying I'm at a place. So we have two different ideas and two words for where. Where to, the idea of direction, and where at, the idea of location. And I'm going to tell you about them a little bit later. And now let's see the examples. For example, в прошлые выходные я ездила на дачу. You see that the word дача again acquired the ending of the accusative case. Дача, дачу. На дачу. To the summer cottage. В воскресенье она ходила на озеро. Again, на озеро, to the lake. Озеро is neutral, inanimate, so it doesn't change in accusative. Озеро stays озеро. На озеро. В следующие выходные мы едем в горы. To the mountains. Again, горы is inanimate plural, so it stays the same. В субботу мы идем в театр. Again, в театр, inanimate masculine, stays the same. To understand better the idea of direction in Russian, please watch my video on the words где and куда. So, где being where at, location, and куда being where to, direction. Again, the link will be in the description. By the way, I think the Spanish language also makes differentiation between where at and where to. Spanish speakers, please tell me if I'm correct. Uh, donde as where at, где, and a donde as where to as a direction word, right? So you can say, uh, donde estas, like where are you now, where are you located? And a donde vas, so uh, where are you going? So please let me know in the comments if it's correct. By the way, the idea of direction in Russian can also be used in a figurative sense, not only in the direct meaning like going to a place, but also, for example, when I say, I have plans for the week. In English, it's the preposition for. In Russian, we still have this idea of direction. What does it mean? How does it work? Uh, for example, imagine that you have a planner, right? So if I make plans, I put my plans on this paper. So I write my plans for the week or for the weekend on a piece of paper. So I put them, see it's direction, I take them from my hand and I move them, there's movement, I move them and put them on my planner, on paper. So when saying um, I have plans for a period of time. This period of time will be still in accusative. For example, планы на неделю. Неделя is feminine with a soft ending, so it becomes неделю. Планы на день. День is inanimate masculine, so it doesn't change. Планы на выходные. Выходные is plural. The full phrase is выходные дни. So 
days off or literally exit days. Plural, inanimate, again, no change. Plany na mesiac, plany na god, plany na subotu, subota is feminine, so it changes, and so on. Also, as I've been thinking about it, being allergic to something um, in Russian can be also viewed as the idea of direction. So that is why we say allergia na uh, pilcu, for example. So we use the accusative case. And uh, I think it's logical because when you are allergic to something, you have a reaction, right? And your reaction goes uh, in the direction of this um, substance or anything that provokes that reaction. The third type of situation when we use the accusative case is the situation of exchange and using the preposition za. For example, я плачу за эту квартиру 4000 рублей в неделю. So, uh, if I'm paying for the apartment, I do some kind of exchange. I give money in exchange for the right to live here. So this idea of exchange in Russian is presented by the preposition ZA. In English it's FOR, uh, but the difficulty is with the preposition FOR, with the translation of the preposition FOR into Russian, is that we have two equivalents or even more, <laughs> but two main equivalents of the preposition for in Russian. And I already have a video on this. Click the link in the description and watch it. Watch about the difference between ZA and DLA. Мои родители платят за дачу 8000 рублей в год. Она платит за электричество полторы тысячи рублей в месяц. Он платит за гостиницу две тысячи рублей в день. By the way, if you noticed, the time periods in these sentences are also in accusative. So when we say per week, per month, per year, per day, it's also in accusative and it moves us to the fourth meaning of the accusative case. Accusative with time expressions. So the fourth situation when we use the accusative case is with words and phrases denoting periods of time or related to periods of time. I already mentioned per week, per month, per year and so on. Next, we have accusative with days of the week, on Sunday, on Monday, on Saturday. Then we have um, answering the question how often, answering the question how long, and finally saying something will happen in a period of time and using it with the preposition через. Let's look at some examples. В понедельник среду и пятницу я работаю. Во вторник и четверг я снимаю видео. В субботу и воскресенье я езжу на дачу. So you see how the feminine days of the week changed in accusative среда Пятница, суббота, change their ending to U. The rest of the words denoting days of the week stayed the same because they are either masculine or neutral. By the way, if you are adding an adjective to a noun in accusative, the adjective also changes in accusative if it's feminine. Let's see. В прошлую субботу Я ездила на дачу. So the adjective прошлая 
changed to прошлую. The principle is the same. А becomes у, я becomes you. So please bear in mind this uh, particularity of um, adjectives. Adjectives always follow the nouns in gender, number and case. We can again see this agreement between adjectives and nouns when we answer these two questions. Как часто? How often? And как долго? How long? For example, каждую неделю я езжу на дачу. So, in this sentence, каждую неделю is the answer to the question how often. Because if you ask me how often do I go to the dacha, I will say every week. So, in your answer to this question, even if nobody is asking this question, but it's implied, right? So, if the question how often is implied and the words every week are the answer to this question, we must use them in accusative. Он ходит в спортзал каждый день. Они ездят на море каждое лето. Мы ходим в ресторан каждые выходные. The question how long? Как долго? For example, как долго ты будешь в России? Я буду в России весь год. Я была на даче всю неделю. Дети отдыхали в лагере все лето. So all these phrases are in accusative again. And I'm sure you have noticed two things. The first one is that in all these phrases we don't use any preposition. So in this case the preposition for doesn't translate at all in Russian. And the second thing that I'm sure you have noticed is that the word for the whole or all agrees with the noun again. It agrees with the noun in gender, number and case. So if we have a feminine word that changes in accusative, неделя, вся неделя changes to всю неделю. So both words change and the principle is the same. А becomes у, я becomes you. So please pay attention to this agreement between nouns and words describing nouns. By the way, do you know how to say one minute, please, in Russian? Одну минуту, пожалуйста. So why do we say одну минуту and not одна минута? Why is it not nominative but accusative? Again, it's connected with the idea how long. Because when I say to you one minute, please, I'm asking you to wait for one minute while I finish uh, something that I'm doing right now and be with you. So, uh, одну минуту for one minute. So, how long do you have to wait for me? For one minute. And that is why it's accusative. The idea how long. And another usage of accusative connected with the period of time is saying in a period of time. So something will happen in a week, in a month and so on. And the preposition here will be через. So pay attention to this. It's not v, it's not na. Here in the English preposition in is translated as через. We have a separate preposition for this idea. For example, он едет в Россию через неделю. Мы 
едем в отпуск через месяц. Она будет работать там через год. Now let's go back to the very first meaning of the accusative case and its key meaning, direct object. And I'm going to tell you about a very useful construction that will make your Russian speech uh, more natural and you can say a lot of things uh, in your conversation using this construction. So, the meaning of direct object. And we are going to use it with the verb ждать, to wait. By the way, again, in Russian, after the verb ждать, to wait, we don't use any preposition. In English, it's to wait for something or for somebody. In Russian, it's just direct object. For example, I'm waiting for you. Я жду тебя. So in this case, тебя is a pronoun, a personal pronoun in the accusative case. By the way, I have another video on pronouns in accusative. And again, I will leave the link in the description and you can watch it. It's not that difficult. You just have to memorize their forms, the object forms of personal pronouns. We also use this verb ждать in the meaning to look forward to. For example, if I'm looking forward to the winter, I will say я жду зиму. And I will add maybe Я жду зиму с нетерпением. So, with impatience, literally. So, I'm looking forward to the winter. That's not true. I'm not looking forward to the winter because I don't like the cold weather. But it's just an example. So, this sentence is standard subject verb object uh, structure. I am waiting for the winter. I am the subject and I am doing something, my action is directed at the winter. Now let's imagine a different situation and a different uh, type of sentence. Меня ждет зима. So, in this case, зима controls the verb now. Зима ждет. Зима is feminine, it's она. Она ждет. And зима became nominative case. Whereas I changed to accusative. Меня. So what does it mean? What's the difference between these two sentences? So in the second sentence, it means that uh, I am expecting something inevitable or uh, something awaits me. So the winter awaits me and I can't do anything about it. It will come and, uh, well, I can't stop it because uh, it's weather, you can't influence that. Well, not yet. <laughs> so, меня ждет зима. Or rather, нас ждет зима. So, people in Russia... Uh, are probably now saying нас ждет холодная зима. So, a cold winter awaits us and we can't do anything about it. It's inevitable. Европу ждут дожди. Again, дожди, it's rain plural. In Russian we have a plural form of this word. Дождь, дожди. Uh, meaning a continuous period of rainy weather. And since дожди is plural and now it's the subject of the sentence, it controls the verb ждать. Дожди ждут. They wait. Они ждут. And the noun Европа, you can see it, is in the accusative case, in the object case. Why do we put the subject at the end of the sentence? Because it's here, it's the most important bit of the sentence. And 
this is something that is inevitable, right? It's very important. So you can't stop it. It's important. So we put it at the end of the sentence to underline this importance. Natasha ждет успех. Again, успех is the subject of the sentence and Natasha is the object. So success awaits Natasha. Here it's something inevitable but something positive. For example, Natasha um, is a beginning actress and somebody might say, well, she is bound to be successful. So Natasha ждет успех. Планету ждет кризис. Well, I'm afraid it's true. We are all expecting some kind of a crisis or maybe we are already in this crisis and it's been going on for a while. So crisis again is the subject of the sentence and planeta, a feminine word, is an accusative. It's the object of the sentence. Тебя ждет сюрприз. Again, um, something inevitable but something positive. And again, um, you can't do anything about it, right? If somebody is preparing a surprise for you, you can't do anything. Uh, it doesn't depend on you. Uh, they will surprise you anyway. So, if somebody says, тебя ждет сюрприз, be ready. So please bear in mind this construction and also bear in mind that the object, the noun or pronoun in accusative can be anywhere in a Russian sentence because we uh, are able to identify it anywhere in a sentence because we are changing the form of it, we are changing the ending. And that is what cases are all about. Some idea gets reflected in the language, in the word form, and we can always spot it in the sentence and know which idea it is. So we don't actually need to use the direct word order, subject, verb, object all the time. We can change the position of the words in the sentence. So these were the main meanings of the accusative case. I hope it was helpful for you. The next case will be prepositional or location. If you have any questions, please write them in the comments and I will answer them. Also write your examples, your own sentences with nouns or pronouns in accusative. Watch additional videos that I have on the accusative case on my channel and Please like the video if it was useful, subscribe for more videos on cases and not only on cases. And I will see you in the next video. Пока-пока!